As Pastor Ron taught us a couple of weeks ago, the Trinity, and I love that song that we were just singing, the Trinity is one of those hard things to get your arms around. We can't fully explain it today, but, you know, because of the Bible, we believe it, and we know later on in our history with the Lord, we'll understand all of those things. But today we don't. So, in the God, there's the identity of one, and yet there's three in one. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So from the very beginning of creation, God intended for us to be together and uh, not be alone. God, the Father, is in constant fellowship with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And therefore, his expectation for us is that we will be in fellowship with him and with each other. So God desires for us not to go it alone, but to be together as we face the challenges of life. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either one of them falls, one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another one to lift him up. Every one of us have experienced setbacks in your life. It may be a health setback. It may be a financial, a spiritual, marriage setbacks. All of that is common to all of us. Those things happen. And yet what he says is, woe to us if there's not another to lift him up. So if we see that God created fellowship, it's his desire that we are together as one body and not standing alone. Well, if God created fellowship, I have a question for you. A couple of questions, actually. Why, why am I ignoring this source of support as I run the race of life? What would my life look like if I would gather together with other believers to share struggles and successes and grow closer to God? And how can I let the busyness of my life stand in the way of what God created for me? Christian fellowship. Now let's speed forward a few thousand years and we find Jesus praying just as he begins, uh, as, just before his arrest. He's praying for all believers. In John 17, 11, he says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one a very specific prayer, that they may be one as we are one. We want to be connected because Jesus is, is, is praying for that connection to the triune God and to each other. So now, here we are at the other side of the cross. And we see Jesus come to earth. We've seen him be crucified, resurrection, and ascend into heaven. But now, we're going to take a look and see what he sends the disciples his promised gift, the helper called the Holy Spirit. And he's going to finish the work that Jesus didn't. That's the formation of his church. The date of this event was a festival that was celebrated 50 days after the first fruits of the barley harvest, the Feast of Weeks. And according to Jewish law, all Jewish men from everywhere had to come to Jerusalem, and they were to personally attend in this festival. This was a pilgrim festival. And because it was a holiday, all the businesses were closed, restaurants were closed, everything was shut down so that everybody could be involved in this. In short, Pentecost, the time of the apostles, was a great grand harvest celebration. The streets of Jerusalem were clogged with thousands of believers coming and, and being in there. Everyone from the known world had come to celebrate the goodness of God and the bringing in of the wheat harvest. The name we give this date is Pentecost, known from the Jewish tradition that commemorates God giving the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai 50 days after the Exodus. At that time, God came with an earth-shaking visitation of fire and lightning. Moses came down from the mountains where he had been with, the Lord for, or with God for 50 days, 40 days, and he had the Ten Commandments, commandments the law. And when he got down, what did he find? He 
found that the Israelites had turned and were, had made and were worshiping a golden calf. And because of their sin, 3,000 died that day. You can read more about that event in Exodus 32. But now back to the New Testament in Acts 2. Here it is again, 50 days after the Passover, and the Jewish people were celebrating the harvest feast. And God comes again with fire. But this time, not a devouring fire, but a consecrating fire. Now, all the disciples were in one place. They may have been in the upper room. They may have been in the temple. But as we read in verse number 3, it appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And all who were touched by the tongues of fire had received the Messiah came to know him in a personal way through the Holy Spirit. In the New Covenant, Peter, empowered by this Holy Spirit, began to preach the gospel. And everyone heard them in their own language. And that day, 3,000 were saved. So that brings us up to where we are in Scripture right now. Verse 41. So then those who had received his words were baptized. And that day they were added about 3,000 souls. Well, this was the birth of the New Testament church. I mean, they had no pastor, no bylaws, no sanctuary, an incomplete Bible. And yet, the members of this new congregation were closer and more deeply involved in fellowship than any other group of people at any other time in history. Think about it. They had taken a radical step, these Israelites, these Jews, in being publicly baptized with Jesus Christ thus divorcing themselves from the Jewish beliefs. They had named the name of the crucified Jesus as their Lord. The church was born of which Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against. They came and heard the gospel preached by Peter, accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord, and then they turned the world upside down. In verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Not only was this a saved church, but it was a church that studied. They were continually devoting themselves to the study of God's Word. They read it, they heard it, they discussed it. By the way, this is very similar to how our growth groups work. We hear the Word of God preached on Sunday. We go away and read it ourselves. We gather together on the date that you've chosen, and we all discuss it among other believers exactly the same way. Well, Mariners has many other opportunities to study God's Word. Every Man a Warrior, which you heard Mike and Bill talk about, it, uh, is one of the ways. Uh, the Mops Women's Study, the Precepts Bible Study. And as we start the new year, we have several more study opportunities that are on the horizon. So, Keep your ear to the ground as we're working on some adult Sunday school programs. Should be an exciting time in 215. And they were in fellowship. The word fellowship comes from the word partner. When you accept Jesus as your Lord, you become a partner with Jesus. Did you ever think about it that way? And when you become a partner with Jesus, you also become a partner with every other Christian. As a church... We are one set of branches connected to one vine. We are one flock with one shepherd, one king with one kingdom, one family with one father, one building with one foundation. But how easy it is to forget that, and, and maybe not even believe that this fellowship thing is even important in our lives. We live in an age of great technological challenges and, and advances. But it's an also an age where our technology can begin to separate us from one another. Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And in that book, he believes that serious thinking has been replaced by entertainment. I can remember a time in my life, when I, and if you're over 50, you might be able to remember this too, when you watch TV, it was around a little tiny screen, and you all huddled very close together so you could see it. And then as technology changed, the TVs got bigger and bigger and more people could come. And then you got 72 inches and the whole side of the room was a TV and lots and lots of people were there and you could see it. 
And then something else happened. The TV started getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And they became a very personal thing. They isolated us. When I would sit around and, and watch those television shows, it was something that was exciting to do as a family. And now then, we have tablets, we have phones, we have things that we can look at individually, and that whole family feeling is gone. And almost everybody in the room has a cell phone, right? Everybody got a cell phone. Almost all of us have. And, you know, they're not just for talking anymore. I, I don't need it to gather in fellowship and worship. Because I've got a cell phone. I mean, I can download the Bible. I don't even have to turn the pages. Just flip, 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 and there I got it. I don't have to uh, hope that Ben is going to play the numbers that I want to sing because I can download from iTunes my own list so I can choose my own songs. And I can get a podcast from almost anywhere, and so I don't have to hope that Bill's going to preach on a topic that I want to hear. I can just select something that's interesting to me, like maybe pray and God will make me rich. <laughs> I've created my own kind of little idealistic world right here on this phone. It separates me. It's personal, and it keeps me totally away from other people. But I wasn't created for a cell phone. That's not why God created me. You cannot really fellowship by yourself, even the Lone Ranger at Tano. But I'm not against technology, but I don't think this is what Scripture is telling us to do. Scripture teaches us that we are to be involved with fellowship, administrating your spiritual gifts and sharing and loving each other. Our growth groups is one of the wonderful ways that you can express that and experience it with the fellowship of believers. And it's, it's my heart's desire that each of you would want to be involved in a growth group. This winter session, which starts, as Bill said, on January 21st. But I understand. I, I can't command you to join a group. It isn't going to work. All right? That just is not going to happen. But let me give you an illustration. If a dump truck came in our parking lot, and it was driving through the lot, and it was full of $100 bills, and it tipped over, and all the money flew out into the parking lot. But I need to organize a committee, command you, dictate you to run out there and gather that money. No, I don't think so. It just spontaneously, everybody in the shopping center would be out there grabbing all those bills. So as a group of believers, I, you have to value what you're going to do. You value the $100 bills, so you run out there and get you. My hope is that you will value the fellowship that you can get in growth groups. So not only were these early Christians studying God's word and fellowshipping together, but they were also breaking bread together. Remember, this is the festival time. There were many more people in the city than there were restaurants and hotels. So those that were local were inviting those that were from out of town to come and share meals with them. They didn't rent out their homes. They just invited those believers to come and have a meal, use their kitchen, eat our food. Imagine what would happen at graduation time at Naval Academy if we just invited all those believers that are coming from out of town into our houses instead of renting them out. We gave them our food instead of making them pay for it. Just a thought. And lastly, it was a praying church. They had just experienced an incredible event. They were given power beyond belief through the Holy Spirit. So how were they to use this gift? How could this gift be shared with others? John 14, 13 through 14 says that from now on, people ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Now that's what people were doing. They were asking. It was a church that was continually devoted to prayer. In uh, most American churches today, if you say you're going to have a prayer meeting, well, a few faithful souls will trickle in and, and be there. But we kind of stand in amazement as we look at the Asian churches that are exploding, that just growing like crazy. And in Africa, where, where Christian churches are growing after unbelievable persecution and the travel, they have to walk two or three miles a day to get to church just to be able to pray and study. And yet here in America, that doesn't happen. 
Well, prayer is the lifeblood of a church. Praying for each other is, is critical, not only for each individual, but for the body altogether. Life's too short to miss the opportunity of being together. Praying together and praying for each other is a special time in our growth groups. Every week here in the worship service, we have an opportunity to fill out your connection card and put prayer requests on it. Well, I challenge you to think a little bit differently, maybe, and that I would ask you to think about your spiritual needs more than just your health or financial needs. Maybe asking God to help you get up a little earlier in the morning so that you can study quietly God's Word with Him. Or maybe you're seeking His advice or direction in a relationship. Or maybe it's just getting to know God better by spending time with Him. Or maybe, like the early church, we could pray for that unbelieving son or daughter or relative or neighbor. In verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. As the unbelieving world watched what was going on with this new church, well, they were just standing in awe. Who were these people that suddenly prayed for each other, shared their belongings with each other, fed each other? Wow, they just were amazed. Now, our culture has misused this word in its current vernacular. Uh, we've turned this word around so that now that it, it's slang, even Disney films use it as a cool saying, awesome dude, say, crush the turtle. This word awe is reserved for special times in Scripture. It's reserved for those times when people's minds are struck about something divine that they can't explain. Webster's Dictionary defines awe as dread, great fear mingled with respect. Deuteronomy 10, 21. He is your praise and he is your God who has done these great and awesome things for you, which your eyes have seen. In Matthew 9, 8. We read, when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God. I mean, they had just seen tongues of fire come down on top of the apostles and heard God's words spoken in their own language. No wonder they were in awe. Sometimes you're, in your life, I'm sure you've felt that as well. Maybe it's a beautiful sunset that you saw. Or another experience that happened, and you just stood back and said, wow, that's unreal. Now, this first church was a miraculous church, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. Why miracles? Because miracles created a sign pointing to the message of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus did miracles. John 14, 11 says, Believe on me for the works that I do. The apostles were given the power to do miracles in order to confirm the word that they were preaching. In Hebrews 2, 3, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So how was it confirmed? Well, by signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit. God was using the preaching with miracles so that the preaching might be believed. Well, let's say five guys came walking through the door, and they came up here, and they all started preaching a different kind of gospel. But one of the guys raised people from the dead. Now, who are you going to believe? Today, we don't need that. We don't need to have, we can have those same five guys come up here, preaching that same gospel that they were doing. But I don't need to have a miracle, because I've got the Word of God. This is what I can trust. I can go to this and I can look and see if whatever that man is preaching is the truth of God. So we don't need miracles in our church today. They're no longer needed to show the truth of the word, but I've got to tell you, that doesn't mean miracles don't happen. I have the privilege of being on the prayer team. And I, uh, I would encourage all of you to be involved in this. It's just such a wonderful time. But being on that team, I've seen marriages restored. I've seen families created. 
I've seen families reunited. That's God still in the miracle business. But he doesn't need to do miracles to prove the truth of his word. So we see that God created fellowship because he created it. It must have value. And now we see that he consecrated it or has a great blessing in this fellowship. And if God consecrated fellowship, where am I believing that I can go it alone, not being involved with other Christians? Who do I need to pray for to join a growth group, a friend, a co-worker, a husband, a wife? Continuing on in verse 44 and 45, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. So we see that we're, they're staying together. Well, why was that? Well, it's because the city called Jerusalem, people, pilgrims from all over the known world were there. Imagine every male Christian in the whole world coming to Annapolis. I mean, where would you put them? I mean, there's not enough houses, not enough room, but they were sharing. They were doing everything they could. At that time, that was a real common thing to do during the festival period. They just did that. That was what they did. But now, with the miraculous coming of the Holy Spirit, suddenly we have a whole new set of circumstances. Suddenly, this little band of apostles grew to a believing church of 3,000 from all over the known world. I think it's important to see God's plan. He didn't just have 3,000 people from Jerusalem. They were from all over the known world. So when they went back, God's message in the gospel would be preached all over the world, just like that. Well, think of the worldly challenges that these new believers were facing at that time. The Pharisees would have been harassing them in the temple because of this new belief. They had been baptized into a faith that the Pharisees thought was blasphemous. Many of those believers had bosses at home that would, would probably fire them if they started to share the gospel. So they started to stay in Jerusalem and learn a little more about this resurrected Jesus that had just given them eternal life. Some of them may have decided to take time off of their jobs or farming or whatever they did so that they could learn more about this gospel. So there was lots of pressure to care for all these new believers. Some of the local believers began to sell things they didn't need so they could provide for those that had a great need. And this could have been the starting of the great American tradition called a garage sale. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 14, Paul says, At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need that there may be equality. But Paul was saying was simply this, if you got a need, I'll help, help it. If I got a need, you'll help me. He who gathered much did not have too much. He who gathered little had no lack. He who gathered much had nothing left over. Why? Because he gave it to the guy that needed something. And the guy that gathered little didn't have enough, so he got what the other guy gave away. It was really a very simple thing that was going on, a way to really accommodate all those new believers in that church. Um, if you would look at, at some of the things that we do in this uh, uh, environment of ours, of giving and sharing, sometimes you say to yourself, well, you know, I don't have very much, so I don't want to give very much away. Um, it, Jesus said, by this we perceive the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. So if you ought to die for him, you certainly could share a buck or two, couldn't you? Now, I trust today that you'd be willing, if you saw a brother in need, to, to help someone out. And Mariners has embarked on a great program with the Lighthouse Shelter, which operates something like the city of Jerusalem did here in Annapolis, helping to provide for the homeless in our community. They're, they're, those are the ones that, that need that extra hand. In these cold winter days, there are many that don't have coats, don't have blankets, don't even have food. If you'd like to help share in their abundance, there's information out in the connection card about uh, the ministry that we're starting down at the Lighthouse Shelter. So let's make our abundance available for those that have so much less than we do. 
No other church founded after this one. Do we ever find people selling their property and sharing their goods? It wasn't necessary. It was a unique situation. God had designed people at different levels of income and different levels of employment. He designed them to be uh, witnesses at different places of society, all according to his plan. You remember from 1 Corinthians 12, 14, for the body is not one member, but, mem but many. We all have a part to play. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Now, I think sometimes this part of Scripture can get a little confusing about what is the selling stuff and all that. And, and, and no place in Scripture does it say that we're all supposed to sell our houses and sell everything and all of our other believers are going to sell their houses and sell everything they have and we'll pool all the money together and we'll all live together. It doesn't say that in Scripture anywhere. It's not some kind of communistic uh, environment that he's talking about. Um, what it does say is that they were uh, sharing Christ, breaking bread from house to house. If they all sold their houses, they wouldn't have any. So they were sharing, sharing bread from house to house. While this refers to the communion, remember that before the communion, Jesus had a meal to celebrate the Passover, which we now refer to as the Lord's Supper. So they were taking their meals together, and then they were taking communion. One of the growth groups that I know of shares a meal together before they study God's Word. And then they, uh, having participated in this meal, I can tell you that it's a, and honestly, I know those members more intimately and more fully just because we sat down, had a dinner together, shared what's going on in our life, and then discussed God's Word. It was wonderful fellowship. I would encourage all the growth groups to try it at least once just to see what it's like. And did you hear this? Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know what it says? It was adding to their number day by day. So we see that, lastly, God celebrates our fellowship. I mean, this was a little church. It had no expansion program, no evangelistic guidelines, no committees that were making up the rules of who could belong. And yet the Lord was adding to their number day by day. And that celebration continues. Every time someone bends a knee to the Lord and accepts Jesus as their Savior and Lord, we celebrate. Every time someone steps into this baptismal pool and publicly confesses Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we applaud. And the Lord will and does add to our number day by day. Well, even though the growth groups have been taking a break during the holiday season, I've listed some questions for you just by yourself to pray about during the next two weeks. They're listed in, in your uh, outline there. In, in light of God's word, what's holding me back from joining a growth group this winter? How am I allowing my circumstances, either at work or at home and family, keeping me from joining a growth group? Why am I afraid to get involved with other Christians in a growth group? And would I benefit from being in a intergenerational group, and how? Well, uh, as Pastor Bill said, we are starting our, our groups up again January 21st. That's a Wednesday night. We're going to have a potluck dinner. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of food, a wonderful time for those that are in groups to get reconnected. And for any of you that are not in a growth group, I really encourage you to come that night. Try to mark it on your calendar and figure out a way to come. I'm not trying to hard sell getting involved in a group. But I think after you see what goes on, you see the fellowship and see how wonderful it is, you may just consider that. So as we started this morning, it was my prayer that everyone in Mariner's Church would see the value of being involved in the growth groups for the winter season. So let's pray. Lord, open our eyes to your desires for us to be connected in the body of Christ. Help us see the value of sharing and discussing your word and fellowship. 
Encourage us to flee from anything that isolates us, anything that creates a private world for us, anything that dominates us with our own preference. Search our, search our hearts, Lord. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.